and welcome. So, hello, everybody. I'm delighted to, um, to well, say hello. Hope you're having a great day. And, um, and I'm really excited that you're enjoying the content for Black Tech Fest. Um, even if you're not watching this live, um, there's lots of really great stuff to happen that you can explore on the platform, on demand and on catch up as well. So we're really delighted to, to have you here. Um, but I've run out of superlatives already within 20 seconds because I'm even more excited for, for, for the guests that I actually have on the, um, the other end of this call. Uh, we've been talk talking for a little bit in the green room here and I'm, I'm, I'm super excited for this conversation. I was like, I'm the jumpy one. One and, and, and Pam here is, is, is far more relaxed and chilled. But I'm really delighted to, to welcome Pam Maynard, who's a, the CEO of Avenard, um, to, to join me in this conversation. And I think we're just going to have a, a, a great chat about a few different things. Um, it's going to kind of meander a little bit between kind of leadership and AI and, and business. So, you know, I'm really, I'm really delighted. But um, hello, Pam, I suppose that's where I'll start. Oh, hi. Thank you very much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Fantastic. So as we uh, jump right into the Black Tech Fest agenda, I know we've got a kind of about half an hour. So I'm actually going to start off by asking you to kind of almost almost give us a pitch to an extent. Like I think there's going to be a lot of people here who who will see yourself and see, wow, CEO of uh, you know thousands, tens of thousands of people, millions and millions in terms of revenue as an organisation, but might not necessarily be familiar with what Avenard is, who you are, what you do, or, or or any of that context. So I'd love it if you could like share with this a little bit in your words, I suppose, yeah, the, the leader in that instance of, you know, what do you want the audience to kind of remember about Avenard? What's what's the mission? And and I suppose, yeah, tell us a little bit about that context for for, for the, the broader audience here. And, so, and thank you. And thank you for your first question, which I know is the first of many, as you told me in the green room. Um, but I think you know, as a leader of a global business, it would be the, I need to start by acknowledging that this has been a very difficult week for many, many people around the world. You know, the awful violence as well in the Middle East, which has resulted in you know, innocent lives lost, has been you know, horrific. And, um, and all around the world, communities are in pain, right? So, you know, for all of those people listening today or maybe listening on um, you know, at a later time, I just want to, wanted to start actually just acknowledging that and just hoping that the people who are listening to us and are impacted or are grieving actually have the support that they, lean, they can lean on and the support that they need at this, at this time. So to answer your question uh, in terms of Avenard, so for those of you who don't know, Avenard was um, created, was formed in 2020, sorry, tw 2000, 2000, when I say in 2020, 2000 as a joint venture between two powerhouses, Accenture and Microsoft. And as a tech consulting company, which is what we are, uh, our focus at Avenard is to work with clients all over the world and across all industry sectors. So we're actually present in 26 countries around the world, uh, across all sectors as well, to help those businesses to transform using Microsoft technology and with us as the leading innovator on the Microsoft ecosystem. But for me, and to your point on purpose, it's not just about the tech, right? Um, it's also about the impact that technology can have on the people who use it which is why when I became the CEO in 2019, September 2019, one of the first things that I did was to formalise Avenal's purpose, which is to make a genuine human impact. So that's a high level view in terms of who we are, when we were founded, uh, you know, the fact that we are created by these two incredible businesses in Accenture and Microsoft and that at the core, we are all about helping clients to transform. And through that, you know, we're led by a purpose which is around making a, a genuine human impact. Amazing, amazing. And actually, if I reflect on something that you just mentioned there, so you you, you recall that you joined kind of in September 2019. And um, you know, if you want to talk about human impact, um, kind of almost about six months later, the world is a very different place. I think all, everybody was impacted in, you know, a different shape, way or form. Um, and, you know, I think that, can be as you said one of the first things you wanted to do when you came in was kind of formalize that kind of mission but um you know I suppose it was really put to the test when when everything kind of you know around the globe as you said for a global business kind of turned a bit upside down pretty much overnight in many instances so 
yeah, I suppose how do you how do you reflect on that? What were some of the the challenges that you faced during during the kind of the pandemic time? And I suppose interestingly for a tech organization, how do you continue to innovate? I think when you know when everybody's kind of concerned about you know lots of things that frankly aren't work as well. How do you how do you think about you know innovation? How do you think about your people? What were some of the challenges you faced, and and what can we kind of learn from from that period into kind of where we are now? Yeah, um, another fabulous question. But let me just correct you on one thing. So I was appointed CEO in 2019, September 2019. I actually joined Amanad in 2008. So I've been with the company a very long time now, so just over 15 years, and I've taken different roles within the company, one of which um, led me to work in the US, which I I'm certain we'll come back to at some point. And it's whilst I was living in the US that I was appointed to CEO in September 2019. Um, and at that point, it was a real, you know, or as you said, you know, then six months later, faced with the pandemic, it was a baptism of fire, to be honest. You know, I was only six months into the, you know, being appointed, as you said earlier, you know, top of the tree, the CEO, and um, and enjoying the kind of, both the kind of, I suppose, the anxiety and the panic that goes with that, as well as the euphoria in terms of having achieved um, that level in my career. And then six months later, you know, we um, we get hit by the pandemic. Also, actually, when I was appointed, it was Avanar's 20th anniversary, so we're also 20 years old, so there's much to celebrate as well. Then the pandemic. And then if you remember as well what happened soon after that, of course, the death of um, George Floyd, and the subsequent Black Lives Matter movement, which also impacted our people as well. Um, and people, our people, communities are in tremendous pain. And as you say, drug, you know, a lot going on back then. And I remember when I first took um, my CEO position, my sister, so I'm one of three siblings, I'm actually the eldest. Um, I have a sister and a, a brother, my brother's the youngest. And I remember my sister saying to me, wow, you know, fantastic achievement, but you do realise the responsibility that you're taking on, don't you, Pam? And, you know, then I was like, okay, yeah, of course I do. You know, I'm taking on this really big company with 60,000 people in 26 countries. Um, but it wasn't, that wasn't what she meant. It was the, the fact that I was stepping into something as a role model, right? And, um, and you know, as well as being a business leader. Um, and that care that I needed to provide and the support um, needed to provide as well, and especially for, um, from an inclusion and an inclusive leadership perspective, that expectation that would go with that. Those were the sorts of things that she meant. Um, you know, without actually then facing into the pandemic. And it's like, you know, how, how on earth do you prepare for all of that? You know, taking on this big role, which is a big role, taking on the responsibility, which comes with a role, and then having to lead the organisation through an incredibly disruptive time, both in terms of the pandemic, and as you say, people working all over the, you know, working from home and no longer in person and together, um, and then also what came afterwards in terms of the tech industry and the massive acceleration that came out, you know, as a result of the pandemic. So the first thing I had to do, um, I'm certain you, Ashley, and others listening won't be surprised by this because you probably have the same challenges, was to accept that things will go wrong, you know, to accept the fact that I can't, wasn't going to be able to control everything. Um, but what was really important was it not to panic. Because, you know, as a leader, you know, your, your emotions, if you like, um, and your temperament is reflects into the organisation. So it's so, so, so important that when things do start to go wrong, you can remain calm, right? And so that the organisation can remain calm. I and mean, that was a piece of advice that I was given when I became the European leader for Avenard uh, by the previous CEO, because at that point I was running the UK, was then promoted to run Europe. Africa and Latin America as it was back then. And he said, you know, Pam, there's no, you're not going to be able to control everything. So just accept things are going to go wrong. Really important though that you don't panic. So that was the first thing. And then, you know, it was about how do I really help our people? How do I help our people to navigate through the crisis? Um, and I was really concerned about their, their well-being. Um, and, and actually that's where, you know, if you like, the innovation sort of started as we thought about the different ways in which we could help our people um, to prioritise, you know, the things that were important to them as well as being able to get work done um, as they needed to. 
Uh, so, yeah, we removed some of our, our key measures around chargeability for a whole quarter to allow people to you know, sort of focus on what they needed to be safe and well, what their families needed as well, um, you know, help around you know, so they could focus on homeschooling or caring for elderly parents or supporting communities. Um, so we did that. Um, and, you know, and, and fundamentally, and that was quite a journey for us, you know, to be able to do that because, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, trust was really required then as well, you know, as from a leadership team, it's like, and also from our employees back to us, you know, it's like, you know, and innovation, the core tenant of it's got to be trust, you know, around empowerment and trust. Um, and so that, that was, you know, really important. And, you know, to be honest with you, those ways of working that we use back then, that we follow back then are still relevant today, you know, in a post-lockdown world where we look at, you know, how we work in Avenard as being as flexible, flex, uh, being about flexibility and choice, people are allowed and our people are empowered to choose, um, you know, we have an alternate work week schedule as well. Um, and so it's the right thing to do. It's been the right thing to do for us. Um, we've seen the results. You know, we've been recognised over a hundred times um, during my tenure as CEO, as an employer of choice or a best place to work. We're in Newsweek's most number three most loved organisations in 2022. Um, and we continue to drive that innovation and performance for our clients as well, which is yeah. most important. Amazing. Well, first of all, congratulations on all those accolades. And it's super interesting to kind of hear that. I think, um, you know, testament to why we're here today. I think um, the work that we do is understood to be important within your organisation and, you know, spending time. You know, you've got, you said to me, you've got, you know, board meetings, you've got other things that, you know, leaders do. And, you know, to, to give this time even today to, to share with the community more broadly, I think is, you know, kind of testament to, to, to how you care about your people and, you know, the other things that are going on, you know, that can draw your attention. If I if I kind of go on to this, because this is like one of the things I definitely wanted to ask you when when I when I you know had the privilege of having this conversation, and it's it's a bit about that representation part and as a leader. So as you've obviously spoken just there about you know some of the decisions that you made and some of the flexibility that you needed to employ, and I think you know that's going to be inspirational to to a lot of you know people, and you know we hear the words representation and role models and. That's partly what today's about, you know, showing leadership and showing people that there's that there's folks like yourselves out there. But um, how do you do it? Because, you know, as a pioneer, you know, if you're if you're the first in many spaces, you, you, you there's not a path necessary to chart, which looks exactly like you. You know, if you are, um, you know, the first person who's, you know, become the CEO, who's, um, you know, a black woman or you're the first person in the room in the elevator, wherever it is, whatever your space is. You know, there's, there's, there's something pioneering about that. And, you know, when you don't have that representation, you don't have that role model who necessarily has that same journey as you. How do you take that inspiration? How do you think about that? How do you reflect on that as a leader, I suppose? Um, yeah, how do you think when when there isn't necessarily someone that you've seen do it before? That's a fantastic question because, you know, through my career, you know, growing up in technology, so I started my career in Oracle, um, you know, my experience, you know, then, uh, you know, and, and sometimes in um, situations, situations even today, I find myself as the only woman in the room, let alone the only black woman in the room, right? So I didn't have, as you, you know, role models, you know, people to look up to, you know, as much as I would have liked um, back then or even today, right? And, and sometimes you do struggle with, feeling isolated, feeling lonely, being the other or feeling like the other. Um, And they're all challenges that you you learn to overcome or I've learned to overcome, although, you know, I still reflect on it every single day, every single day in our field. Um, And, you know, so how did I get there? You know, how did how did I do that? I think it, it starts for me, and you and I were talking about this earlier in the green room, because I was telling you that I've got a catch up today with um, uh, one of my mentors. But mentors have been really important to me. And my first mentor uh, was my mum. All right. Uh, And so my mum was um, part of the Windrush generation, came to the UK from Barbados. And, yeah, she really taught me and my siblings. um, In in effect, she gave us the courage. She encouraged us 
here to share our perspectives, to put ourselves into difficult situations that maybe sometimes felt in- uncomfortable um, so that we could be seen and we could be heard. And so, and she mentored us um, from that perspective, um, you know, and really helped me and, you know, to overcome or to understand in effect that what makes me different also makes me powerful. Right, and that as well is, you know, something which I've learned to reflect on. Especially, you know, going back to your point on innovation, we know that the best, you know, uh, innovative ideas, you know, come from diversity of thought, right, come from difference of thought and being able to pull that together. Um, And so I think it's really important that we remember that, you know, what makes us different also can make us powerful, right? And I often say this to people as well, you know, and but... Yeah, and then use that platform, right, to find your voice. But I've talked about this many, many times because I'm one of these people that's inherently shy, so I've also had to work through that. Um, But, you know, and I've asked my mentors, my mentors have really helped me with that to create opportunity and space in their room for me to have that experience of feeling uncomfortable by sharing my voice. Um, You know, and also I think as I, well, not as I I think, but as I've got more senior um and become more responsible for more and more people I've also learned if I'm not sharing my voice then I'm not actually doing a good job for them for the people that I represent my teams that I represent because if I'm not being heard they're not being heard and taking the the limelight off of me in a way and just thinking about others also has helped me in terms of finding my voice and then the second thing that gives me strength, energy, you know, whatever word you want to use, actually, it's actually about community. You know, I talked to you about the fact that I moved to the US and I was in the US when I was appointed CEO. I was living in Seattle. Um, And, you know, Seattle because of the proximity to Microsoft. So going from London to the West Coast on my own and nothing prepared me for that. Nothing prepared me for how different that was going to be in terms of uh, a living um, experience. And um, and so I connected into a local group, a black African-American group. Um, to really kind of understand more about what it felt like, you know, living in the US, to be able also to connect to a wonderful group of people who helped me to find my bearings um, and helped me to understand my new environment. And so, you know, I also want to, you know, be sure that people understand. And, and sometimes we talk about the fact that networking is really difficult. I actually think the way in which the opportunity that we have now through technology to network you know, through other social um, mechanisms actually you know it makes it li- a little bit easier um, but think of the network you know, and think about how you can use that network to get those diverse perspectives so you can continue to advance in terms of innovation but not only that how you know that network can provide you support like it did for me, for me. it provided me with confidence um, when I was hitting any knockbacks but then also you never know what doors that network can open for you mm-hmm. right and that's the other yeah no that's a really big you know we say that actually for for tomorrow's day so um you know if you're watching this live tomorrow we've got our futures there at black tech fest and that's all about helping people build that early career network um and actually even for our ignite day on thursday that's that's the main reason people come they want to they want to meet and network and mingle and it's because you know when you put lots of great people in great space just good things will happen <laughs> you know i don't need to do too much let me bring people there and the magic will occur, uh, um, you know, and that's, that's my, my aim, put good people together and then, you know, watch the results. Um, so I'm going to move tech slightly because this wouldn't be a tech conference unless we talked about the elephant in the room, the biggest buzzword slash transformative thing that's going on in society, really, and that's artificial intelligence. So there, I've said it. For anyone playing bingo right now, you can tick that off. Um, but you know, if, if we kind of get into that slightly, um, obviously you are, you know, having conversations with clients at the very highest level. Um, you know, you are you are right in those rooms where a lot of people don't even know those rooms exist in some instances. 
And, you know, for, for us, that gives us the really key opportunity to answer almost, you know, what, what happens behind those closed doors? You know, if we're thinking about AI, you know, what are companies talking about? What are they thinking about? You know, and what does, what does that mean for the future? What kind of insights are you able to share about kind of, you know, where you see the direction of travel regarding artificial intelligences and how that might reflect on, you know, your own leadership and your own organization or, you know, some of the clients that you also serve? Yeah, um, and again, you're right. We can't be talking tech without talking AI at all. Um, and it absolutely is, well, a buzzword. I'm not sure if I'd say elephant in the room. <laughs> 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 Until you put it there. Until you put it there. <laughs> but, um, yeah, our clients, you know, just like us, are navigating accelerated pace of change. You know, we're in a world of, you know, constant disruption, continual change, um, you know, lots of unknowns as we look forward, especially as a you know, business leader, you know, where the hell is <laughs> the next, few, next couple of months even going? Um, and so there's a lot to navigate as well as the macroeconomic environment as well, how that's shifting and changing buying patterns in organizations. But, you know, fundamentally, you know, they are as well thinking about the buzzword um, as AI. Um, because they need partners that can help them to reimagine their future um, and transform to be able to capture, you know, whatever opportunity they're looking to capture and do that. And, f- and also, in, and in doing so, extract even more value from maybe the t- existing technology investments that they've made. You know, because all of our clients are trying to balance, you know, return on investment, um, as well as trying to stay ahead of competitors and ahead in the market. Um, so yes, AI is absolutely front of mind. There isn't a single conversation that we have internally, externally with clients, with Accenture and Microsoft, um, and, you know, that, that doesn't involve AI. Um, you know, real, real market opportunity. Bloomberg actually estimates that the market, the opportunity in 2032 will be around 1.3 trillion, from about 40 billion or so, where it's um, where it wow. is today which is huge, as you've said. So a lot of opportunity for those innovators out there, um, you know, to really, for it to ignite their imaginations in terms of how they might capture that opportunity. We also um, kicked off a piece of market research, and going back to customers, we um, surveyed 3,000 business and IT executives globally, and the results were genuinely exciting. So 97% of business and IT leaders are using um, AI in their current role, right? At least weekly. But 97%? 97% of our 3,000, right? Um, Because remember, AI is not just about generative AI, Mm. right? AI is a spectrum and it's been out there for a very long time. You know, we've got AI, you know, just in your smartphones on, you know, Word, whatever, even before co-pilots, right? You know, it was there. Um, and so they're using it, but 92% of them say that they need help, right? They need help to shift to an AI first you know, world operating model and do that in the right way. Yeah, and I think, you know, there, so there is this emphasis as well of, yes, we want to harness it, but how do we do it in the right way? You know, in Avenard, you know, what we're doing, we're actually looking at how we harness AI. Absolutely. I mean, we're a tech company. But how do we become client zero in effect for some of the great technologies that Microsoft is um, is releasing? You know, so I can talk to clients about our own journey and our own story. You know, because we look, for example, to become one of the first companies to adopt Microsoft Copilot at scale, um, uh, which will be GA'd soon. Um, you know, there is a really unique opportunity as well for us and you know to, and our clients to turn experimentation with the technology um, you know, into sort of, you know, larger scale application. And that's what we're doing. So we're largely experimenting right now with processes from account management, you know, through sales to software engineering to um, talent uh, acquisition. Um, So we're learning, if you like, where the technology actually will bring value to the organization and experimenting with it. And largely our clients are in the same place. Yeah, you know, how can they use technology to help them, for example, in customer service, if I begin bring a better customer service? You now, how can they use AI to actually, you know, around knowledge mining and content 
generation. Um, they also recognise that it's not one size fits all. All right, this is why I was saying to you there's Gen AI, but it's part of a spectrum of AI technologies. Um, and so, you know, they also recognise they may need to evolve their infrastructures. They need to consider the cost implications of that. Uh, and, and that's why AI readiness is really at the heart of the conversations that we're having with our clients and how to get ready. Got it. And I think well, this brings me on to kind of like two tacks. And I, you know, I know we've only kind of got five minutes or so left. So I'm going to kind of hit them both at you just so you can um, kind of reflect on them before before you um, you come back on them. But I think there's two answers, I think, or two questions. I think the first is obviously this is the Black Tech Fest. And, you know, one of the conversations that we're having across the festival is all around you know, AI, as you can imagine, but some of that's around the ethics and, and, you know, making sure that AI actually works for everybody. And it's not kind of a preserve of people in Silicon Valley and the rest of us can kind of just, you know, just deal with whatever happens. So I'd really love to understand, you know, from an Avenal perspective, again, like, you know, are those conversations happening? What are you saying to people in terms of that equity and accessibility piece? And then the second part to also what I wanted to get is, as you said, you know, if you're in that experimentation mode, you're talking about, you know, trying things out and getting them ready. From a people perspective, what are some of the things you, you know, you think people should be doing or thinking about in terms of preparing for AI? You know, one part of the festival is actually really for people who are looking to get into the industry. And, and you're right, there's a massive AI opportunity out there. And that's great for the technology. But there's also potentially that for a load of people who might be able to, you know, take advantage of new opportunities, which otherwise they might not have today. So what are some of the things that you think people should also be thinking about or preparing for um, alongside companies? Yeah, yeah. And again, two fantastic questions and very, very relevant. Um, you know, in our AI journey, so, you know, I've now appointed a chief AI officer um, and he sits on my executive committee and is helping me and you know, as well to make sure that we are approaching AI in a responsible and ethical way. Um, you know, we have um, launched our first ever responsible AI policy. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, which is a big step, if you like, or the first step under you know, his leadership. So, you know, and that will continue to evolve, especially as regulation evolves as well. We'll need to harness that. But I actually think that we as leaders, because we're always going to be ahead of the regulation, the regulation is always struggling to catch up. We need to make sure that we're leaning in and, as I say, have a responsible AI policy. Um, which does some of the things that you say, you know, in terms of making sure that we've got the right representation. You know, we know already that only 9% of AI specialists around the world are women. Um, and, only, um, and then, you know, in the US, only 10.2% uh, are Black African Americans. So we haven't got the diversity of thought, if you like, in, in that community yet. Um, but with that comes opportunity, absolutely, and we'll come back to the skills piece. I think it's really important that as part of a responsible AI framework that enables us to keep responsibility, trust, transparency as non-negotiables as well in an AI first world um, and ensuring that, you know, not just how we develop the algorithms, but also how we review the output of those algorithms is really important from my perspective. Um, and so keeping that front and making sure that you've got processes in place to, and also the diverse teams in place to keep reviewing, you know, the output and then continuing to, to, to tune, if you like, the models. Um, and then keeping people center stage. You know, I talked about the fact we're purpose-driven organization, people first, um, you know, very much so. Um, and I think so on a fundamental level, AI first, it should also be recognized as human first. You know, it's a tool for doing what matters for people and communities. That's how I look at it. And in terms of the skills and capabilities, you know, there are well, clearly, you know, data, data engineering is at the heart. Uh, because we need to make sure that the data platforms are sorted out, that we're getting decent, you know, getting cleaning up the data, et cetera. So that's a big opportunity. Um, prompt engineering will be a new, another one. And a lot of people are talking about prompt engineering as a new emerging skill, to your point. And don't think that you need to be a deep data science scientist to be a prompt engineer. Some of the, you know, I asked the same question earlier this year of our team in Malaysia. 
And um, they were telling me that requirements analysts, business analysts make fantastic prompt engineers um, just because of the way in which they ask questions when they're facilitating sessions for clients. Um, you know, green software engineers. So looking at different, you know, is also emerging as more important. DevSecOps, so security. You know, if we think about how do we create a safe space, how do you, you know, security and improving security resilience and posture is really important in an AI world. Um, so that security engineering is also um, plus it, important, plus other emerging technologies as well, actually. But I'm certain the people that are, are um, you know, are, are going to be part of your next couple of days or so will have loads of ideas in that regard as well. Well, there we go. But the ideas don't stop. So um, whilst, um, yeah, we've, we've, come to, we've come to the time that, you know, I have with Pam and I, you know, appreciate she's the CEO, she's super busy. So I don't want to take up too much of that. Um, but we, we're continuing this conversation with webinars. We have a webinar um, which you can find out on all of our Colony Tech channels, across our newsletters, our socials, or come along to the festival over the next few days and we'll sign you up and we'll tell you about it. In a couple of weeks on the 26th, we'll be continuing to have this conversation about generative AI and what that means for businesses and engineers and, and all of the sorts. Um, so yes, make sure that you um, you watch out for that across our channels. But I'd just like to say a massive thank you so much to Pam. Um, it's I, I've been smiling throughout the conversation. I'm smiling when we got here. Like I'm still doing it now because you know I've really enjoyed the opportunity to speak to that, um, and 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 more so actually that I've been able to you know ask some of these questions and share that with our audience. So I'd just like to say a massive thank you to to Pam again for her time and the whole team at Avenard as well for making making today happen. And you know this is part one in that as well. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to to the future conversations that we're having on that and how we can share share some of these important themes with 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 the community so without further ado thank you for everybody else keep watching black tech fest and um thank you again pam oh thank you it's been wonderful to be here